We're going to want to hear from you today. It's our monthly call-in show on Restoring Hope Live. Restoring Hope Open my heart to sing Taking the darkness inside Revealing your light Restoring Hope Open my eyes to see See the world through different eyes Revealing your light Restoring Hope Good afternoon. It's the 21st day of July in the Lord's year 2013. My name is J. Michael McCoy, and this is Restoring Hope Live, a broadcast ministry to help people with life's hurts, habits, and hangups. Dr. Mike Hartwig, my co-host, along with Bob Montserrat, who's a monitor in our chat. The chat is available for you online live at restoringhopelive.com. Today's going to be an interesting show, and I appreciate uh, you listening today, but I'm going to need you to call in. I'm going to give you the number. Uh, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you a half a dozen times here in just the first few minutes so you can grab uh, your uh, P- PDF and put it in there, or you can write it down on a piece of paper, or you can put a sticky note someplace, or you can just dial it. It is toll-free nationwide, one 855 1855 244-0077. You got it? You might want to put that in your PDA, not your PDF. Big difference. Is there? Yeah. I'm, what's a PDA? It's a personal digital assistant versus a... What's a PDF? It's a, like a... A file. It's a file form. <laughs> a file form. But just put it in your phone. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. Smartphone. Way, uh, you're dumb. From now on, we're going to call dumb phones Mac phones. Okay. <laughs> What'd you say? PDAs were used in 2000, by the way. <laughs> so I'm showing my. And how old were yeah. you in 2000? I was about uh, 16. 16. Okay. In 2000, I was uh, 18. We would say put that in your app or download it or. But Mac would say, go ahead and start training your rotary dial finger. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I'd say get your post-it note and write it. Th- or, or grab your Dext. No, grab your Ma Bell phone book and write it under important numbers to save. Remember those? I remember I remember every year my mother transferring yeah, those Yeah, right. Over. I did too. All yeah. Right. So here's the question. And this may not refer to you. You know, so ma- so much of what we do here on Restoring Hope Live isn't about you. It's about someone you know. Maybe it's someone you know, wink, wink. I have a friend who, and that's okay. We don't care. This program is here to help you understand life's hurts, habits, and hangups and help you get through those. That may be that hurt that your spouse is an alcoholic or that you were raised with alcoholic parents, or that your child, someone you love, a sibling, has become an alcoholic, started acting as an alcoholic or a drug addict. It's either one. But what we want to know today, because here's the basis of a lot of treatment, and and Joe Mainz is here, and I love Joe Mainz with all my heart. He's a brother in Christ with me, but we see one thing different about sobriety. You've been sober how long? Um, you should know this. It's maybe like 10 and a half years, something like that. Okay. I've been sober 1174 days. Not that I didn't know exactly what time, um, but, uh, which is a little over three years. I got sober by accepting the fact that my alcoholism is a disease. It is not something I can control. I need a higher power and my higher power is called Jesus Christ. And I need meetings. I go to 12-step meetings. I was at one yesterday. I go to four or five a week. My dad's so funny. He'll say, do you still need to go to those meetings, son? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've been sober for so long. And I say, dad, do you still need to go to church on Sunday? Because you've been a Christian for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, And your philosophy is still Christ-centered, but what? Uh, Addiction is just like any other sin that prevents us from fulfilling the purpose that we were created for. All right. So, and you don't believe alcoholism is a a disease. I don't. You believe it's a a crutch? 
I believe that it's a learned dependency. It's a learned habit, just okay. like most other sins. It's something that you start putting in that place of God to function in your daily life. Okay. Now, if if we believe it's a disease, I'm sorry, we do believe it's a disease, but it's 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 a sin yeah. to abuse it. But when you are an alcoholic, it is something that you were born with. Therefore, how do you perceive that I was born an alcoholic? I don't believe you were born an alcoholic. Okay. You believe it's just... Uh, uh, so if I if I love pornography, yep. uh, I- I- am I born to love pornography? No. You were born to be within virtuous boundaries of enjoyment of sex. one 244 7 from the experience you've had, and don't, don't, please, it's Sunday. Don't look at your radio or your internet and say, I don't know anybody who's an alcoholic. That's just not possible. Is that, guys, Joe, is that hey, possible? You may not always be aware of the people that are alcoholics, but I can assure you that you do know someone who's an alcoholic or an yeah. addict. Or- Bob, you're a forensic scientist. Any idea what the statistics of how many alcohol, well, look this up because you probably don't know this, but I'd like to know how many people who have alcoholic tendencies, who act like alcoholics, who drink too much in their life, ever go in for treatment. Do you know that number? Oh, geez. I mean, they uh, say one out of 10 of us is an alcoholic. They really say one out of three is either directly or indirectly affected by someone struggling with an addiction every day. One out of three. Is struggling with an addiction is uh, is affected by someone. So they oh, either okay. know somebody in their immediate family or a friend, or they're they're either directly or indirectly affected by addiction each day. So, and that's probably a, a better number to work off of. Uh, that'll really tell you, first of all, how big the problem is, and okay. and it also tells you that just by looking at it in that dynamic, it makes sure that people understand that it's not just the actual person suffering with an addiction. It's the people all around them that are also being affected by that. So. Yeah. And, and and by the way, if you think to yourself, well, it's, I don't affect anybody. I mean, I may drink too much. I give you that. But I just go home at night and, you know, I just I, I don't yell. I don't scream. I just sit there and I just kind of pass out in my chair and I go to bed. That doesn't affect anybody. What's your kids thinking? What's your spouse thinking? What's your mom and dad think when they know, well, you can't call him that late. I mean, he won't be coherent. I, I got a couple of questions. How are you defining disease? Is alcoholism a disease? Well, I would tell you that in 1973, the AMA, the American Medical Association, deemed it a disease. Deemed alcoholism a Alcoholism. Disease. Some would tell you they did that so it would be covered by insurance. Okay. Okay. You would say... Absolutely, that's a that's primary the only reason factor. they did it. But they've also they've also deemed homosexuality as a disease too, and, and now, then they pulled it pulled it back. And also obesity and obesity. Yeah. Just currently, but and but they pulled homosexuality back. Yeah, yeah. it's no longer. It a used disease. to be defined as a as a disorder. Right. Uh, now it's not. Okay. I mean, and that's right. that's disorder. really yeah, the I think premise of most of my viewpoints is really looking at okay. Who decides what? Why? And unfortunately, most of what I've seen has been based on a cultural shift in opinion rather than some concrete new finding of uh, something based in science that says, okay, this is now classified as. Uh, Especially when you look at the new behavioral disorders. Now, it used to be you either met the criteria for a mood or behavioral disorder or you didn't. So you think that the AMA did it for insurance reasons and insurance reasons only? Uh, primarily for insurance reasons and also just this cultural shift in opinion that, uh, well, we've uh, got to find something behind this. All right. Uh, phone lines are open. one 855 244 That's on the website, by the way. Phil from Texas is on the line. We'll take his call when we come back from this break. I'm J. Michael McCoy, along with Dr. Michael Hartwig, my partner and uh, cohort, and also Mr. Bob Montserrat, who watches our chat. Our special guest, Joe Mines from St. Gregory's, were being produced today by uh, Tom and Larry. Harry couldn't make it. And, of course, you. And we thank you for listening. We love this job. We couldn't do it without you. And we'll be back on Restoring Hope. Restoring Hope. 
I'm Jay Michael McCoy with Joe Mites from St. Gregory Retreat Center. Joe, when it comes to addictions, what kind of services does St. Gregory offer? St. Gregory Retreat Center is a national leader in substance abuse treatment and that our residential programs really first assure that someone is well enough to recover. What really sets us apart is that we're not going to enter into this idea of treatment from the standpoint that you just are a diseased person and needs to learn how to manage your life. We're really coming at this from the perspective of you are a created being and you're created with gifts and value and talent. There's a purpose for your life. There's a love in heaven with your name on it. And our job is to really help you to understand what's driven these things in your life so far. How do we give you the skills and teach you the techniques to turn around some of those negative thought processes, handle some of those negative emotional reactions to life, and really take control through an empowerment-based program to help you really start to maintain some real happiness and joy in your life. And that's something entirely different than anything I'm aware of in a recovery atmosphere. Everything I've really ever seen is really coming at this from the standpoint of trying to manage things for now, help you feel better for now. A lot of times you're given a pill for your addiction or they're trading out a drug for another drug. We're really going to make sure that, look, the person that's walking through our doors has a lot of value. Not everything in their lives is bad. We need to understand what are those good things? How do we help them recognize those good things? And how do we help them gauge their society and culture and families and their own lives with those gifts and talents that they've been given in a way that's really going to provide them some true satisfaction in life? You don't have to deal with this alone. We can walk with you through this process. All right. How do we get a hold of St. Gregory's? You can reach us anytime at 888-778-5833 or you can find us on the web at stgregoryctr.com. Hi, this is John Vodder. Someone asked my advice with this question. My child's on drugs. How do I deal with well-meaning but intruding family members? Every family member is different, but the welfare and the health of the addict always have to be paramount. Now, this does not mean that other relationships are ignored. It just means that this addiction thing is strenuous, it's debilitating, and it's energy draining. It is tough on all of us. And so when we have a family member who's intrusive, we need to understand that our immediate response and responsibility is to protect the immediate family. We might have to say, I'm sorry, but we simply can't talk right now. I'm sorry, but your questions are intrusive. I'm sorry, but I need to help my child. Find guidance through life storms. Visit lighthousenetwork.org. The Pocket Testament League presents Pocket Power. Read, carry, and share the gospel every day. I introduce the Pocket Testament League to the ladies of our women's ministries and ask that they give 60 testaments away. I encourage them to take them to work, to restaurants, to hair appointments. And we left that meeting with not one testament left. This is Mike Brickley, president of the Pocket Testament League. League members have found that any place is a good place to share a pocket gospel with someone they meet. Join us and you'll always be ready. Is there anything more important? One of the ladies works at a health unit and couldn't wait to leave one in the waiting area. I praise God for your league. I can't wait to share the ministry with our church and we've already started handing out the Pocket Testaments to visitors. What are you waiting for? Read, carry, and share the gospel every day. For more information, call 1-800-636-8785 or visit pocketpower.org. That's pocketpower.org. Restoring hope. Open my heart to sing. Taking the darkness inside. minutes after the hour on the 21st day of July in the Lord's year 2013. I'm Jay Michael McCoy. Thanks for listening today. Love this job. Couldn't do it without you here on RestoringHopeLive.com. Let's go straight to our phones as we're asking people today uh, live on the radio, is alcoholism a disease? Let's go to Phil in Texas. Phil, how are you? Welcome to the show. I'm good. I'm I agree that alcoholism, because the AMA went and said it's a disease, but I also agree that it's a sin. But uh, actually, uh, when I, I called in, you very briefly touched on another addiction that actually I'm fighting with right now, 
and that's the sexual immorality that I'm a, I'm currently in a 12-step continuing victory uh, program through another another ministry, and it's you know it's it's actually as devastating and as expensive you know monetarily, emotionally, mm. uh, family as any alcoholism or drug addiction or, you know, it's a, it's a sickness too. Are you I talking pornography, to, Phil? I'm talking about pornography. I'm talking about immoral sexuality. I'm talking about the whole bit. Phil, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you reached out to the Lord to try to figure that out. How would someone approach or how would someone at St. Gregory's approach uh, Phil in this way for his uh, addiction to pornography? Phil, thanks for the call very much. Well, St. Gregory's is always going to be primarily a substance abuse facility, but this is a really important topic, especially, uh, Bob, you'd mentioned somebody was on the chat that said, my body is just different than someone who is not an alcoholic. Well, what's different about somebody's body who is struggling with a sexual addiction? Is that a different biological makeup? Yeah, yeah. just like if somebody's Um, drinking all the time, does that mean, okay, I have a sudden urge to, uh, my body changes, Chris, that's what... Some right. MEA I mean, people uh, say my body changes. It has an over, overwhelming desire for that alcohol, and it changes. Well, the trouble I have is, is okay, so obesity can fall into that category. Well, what about pornography? They look at p- porn, and then all of a sudden, they yeah. change too? Yeah, I thought that was interesting because my, my – and, Dad, if you're listening, you're going to find out something. Dad, my father hid his Playboy magazines under his socks in the drawer, and I knew where they were. He just liked it for the articles. I've, I, I imagine. Yeah. And I remember as a young child <laughs> thinking – Okay, I'm a I'm a boy. I'm a man. I, I like that. That's appealing to me, but didn't do anything for me. And I didn't realize the significance of that until I discovered I was an alcoholic. Because when people say, "How do I know I'm an alcoholic?" Well, there's a hundred reason answers to that, and probably all of them are right. Mine is a normal drinker gets to a point when they take a sip of alcohol and they say, "Oh, I've had enough." Well, wait a minute. What's normal? Well, exactly. Someone who's not an alcoholic. What does it, that mean? Well, yeah, what, yeah. You, when right. you say, I'm trying to explain a, that. <laughs> when you say that there's a hundred answers and all of them are right, I would say that there's a hundred answers and mostly they're subjective and could just as easily be wrong. Okay. Mine would be when I found out that when I got to a certain point when I started getting that buzz, we all know that feeling, whether it be right. at champagne at a wedding, but your daughter got married yesterday. Yep, Congratulations. You Did you. you have a glass of champagne? Uh, and I didn't, ironically. Was no, there champagne it, there? Yeah, there was. Okay. Yeah. Somebody will drink a glass of champagne and they'll get a little oozy and they'll say, oh, I, that's, that's it. I don't like that feeling. I drink a glass of champagne and I get that feeling and I go, I want more. I'm like that big plant on that. What was that? That play the plant that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and finally eats its owner. What's the what's the what? The, uh, oh, little shop of horrors. Little yeah. shop of horrors. That's who lives within me. Whore. Thank you, Harry. If Feed we're talking about more. pornography, it'd be little shop of horrors. Yes, <laughs> but it's that point when all right, I'm a little tipsy. I'm a little. I want more, and I lose my ability to understand. I, I can't have more. The, the issue I have with all that is this, if you say it's a disease, it's almost like an, an excuse because I have those feelings, too, when I eat something or when I look at pornography or when I drink. I don't think that's I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is, is what do you control? Bob, what was the comment that you had on the chat? Well, as Joe had mentioned, uh, uh, this is MP on chat. As an alcoholic, my body is different than non-alcoholic. My body has a biological mandate. Once alcohol hits my mouth... And then I asked the question, uh, was that from the very first drink? And he said, from the second drink. Yeah. And that was the only thing that was weird. And Joe, you and I have talked about this. And, and when I get to heaven, God will tell me what the answer to this is. I also suffer from a mental disorder. And when I went to a specialist and finally said, I need to quit drinking. I hate drinking. I don't want to drink anymore. I'm done. He put me through a couple therapy sessions and he said, well, Mac, you have a mental disorder. And until we figure out that mental disorder, you will continue to drink. So we spent four years getting rid of the mental disorder or learning for me to live with it. And then I, it took me four months and I quit drinking. But what, he, what Bob read from that listener is exactly right. You had a drink and it and it became a mandate to have another drink. Yes. A mandate. Yes. I, Except, guess what? That didn't happen to me until I was 34. See, I... I'm I, a, I had, uh, we what had, happened to you before then? We had, All right. 
We, my, my parents had a, but again, if mom and dad are listening, I'm dead. But they had a liquor cabinet, and I knew where the key was, and I liked slow gin. I, I lived in a farming community. There was always beer around. I just never liked the taste of it. So what's the difference between slow gin and fast gin? <laughs> and, and, and Really, and seriously, is it a type of gin? It's S-L-O-W. It's, <laughs> my, my, it's S-L-O-E. My uncle was a pathetic <laughs> alcoholic. There was always alcohol there. When I worked in nightclubs as a disc jockey, mm-hmm. I might drink a half a gin and tonic. Well, that's impossible. If you were born an alcoholic, you would have, from the get-go... Never put it down. And and for what what odd reason you would have always had this temptation toward alcohol even before you necessarily even knew of it. I know. Um, so I know. to me, those things don't line up. What I'm You're seeing right. is they don't line up. What I'm seeing are learned behaviors. Yeah, I'm seeing I'm seeing things that come into our existence <laughs> that help fill gaps that a lot of times we weren't even necessarily aware that there was a gap. Uh, we see this especially with prescription medications, people who are totally fine in life. They've got good families, good jobs, everything's well. They'll, they'll have pain from a surgery or whatever. They'll be put on narcotic painkillers. All of a the sudden, they can still feel better than for whatever reason they were able to feel before. And your brain will start to develop an affinity towards certain chemicals, towards certain behaviors, toward anything that helps us feel as though life is better this way than it is without it. And that's when it starts to become an issue for us. I, I, there are biological implications to addictions. We do start to retrain our brains how to function. Uh, when you introduce something that wasn't pri- uh, there prior and your brain sees that as a good thing, especially these chemicals that are really, they're affecting the same types of neurotransmitters, we're going to see that as more optimally functioning, whether it's rational or not. Do you, Joe Mines from St. Gregory's here. And again, I, this is a day we need to hear from you. one 855 244 right at the front of the website at RestoringHopeLive.com. Do you think uh, that your treatment at St. Gregory's, which is Christ-centered, but you don't ever get them to say, my name is Mac and I'm an alcoholic? No. Right? And that's the first thing we're trained I mean, here, I've got my, my 12 by 12. And, well, and well, from a Christian perspective, what we would get people to say, my name is Mike Hartwig, and I'm a sinner. And alcohol is my sin? I, 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 if you want to do that, I, I, I guess I don't have any problem with it. But the difference here is, is if you say it's a disease, from my, it's a scapegoat, it's an excuse, it's, it's like saying, well, I can't help it. I can't help it that I got a cold. Okay. I mean, that's, that's in essence, that's what you're saying. Here's step one. Step one is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. That's tough. Read that again. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol. Now take alcohol and put sin there. I agree. We admitted we were powerless over sin and our life had become unmanageable. Okay. And from a Christian perspective, what we would say is the only way that you're going to overcome that is... Through the power of Jesus Christ. All right, let's. Uh, and then, and then, step two is came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And then, step three is the only time um, that God. Well, it's not the only time, but it's. Here's an here's another issue I have with that though, and this is this is really the crux of okay. what my issue is with this. And I think it's a great program, and I would encourage and I have encouraged people to get involved with twelve step program. When you say alcoholism. And it's it's not broader. You you have a tendency to get involved in something else. You can take care of alcoholism, but who's to say next time it's not going to be obesity right, or I'll, pornography? I want to go to Rob real quick in Decatur, Illinois, because I think he's saying just what you do. Okay, uh, thirty seconds, Rob. What you say? I I agree with everything that's coming up. That we tend to focus on alcohol and drug addicts. and uh, we've all got a weakness, and the devil knows what our weakness is, and that's what he attacks. And I've never taken a drug before in my life. I've drank and and have been able to put it down when I want to put it down. But food has been a has been a problem in my life, and it uh, you know the devil knows that and he keeps attacking it and and that uh, so I, I think and I think we've driven a lot of people away from the church because we we focus on drug addicts and alcoholics as as having a, a real problem. See, and I, 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 I love what Rob says because, it, you know, I, I, I can put food down at all, but but I, I, I can't put alcohol down. He can put alcohol down and not food. We've got a free book for you from Dr. Hartwig. We'll tell you how you can get it next. Richard in Tennessee, hang on. We're coming back to you. 
is Dan Celia with today's Stewardship Moment. In Isaiah 55, God makes it clear that his word does not go forth and come back void or empty. He says this, but I shall accomplish that which I purpose. I shall succeed in the things for which I sent it. Listen, I don't know about you, but I have never found a place in all of scripture that when God spoke, nothing happened. Listen, whenever Jesus spoke, it came to pass. In my life, whether it was destruction, healing, or love, something happened when God spoke. When you read the Bible or pray, listen to what God has to say about his will for your life. You've just heard a stewardship moment with Dan Celia of Financial Issues Ministry, helping you plan, give, and invest wisely. For more information, log on to financialissues.org. That's financialissues.org. Every day I wake up at 5 to give dad his medicine. Every day I wake up at 5 to give dad his medicine. At 6, I make his breakfast. Every day I wake up at 5 to give dad his medicine. At 6, I make his breakfast. At 7, I shower. Every day I wake up For those five. caring for a loved one, we hear you. That's why AARP created a community to help us better care for ourselves and the ones we love. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. <laughs> This moment of uncontrollable laughter was made possible by a 32-year-old man with little to no coordination attempting to execute a simple cartwheel. His name is Sergeant Warner, but young James, our laughing friend here, simply calls him Dad. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. The Pocket Testament League presents Pocket Power. Read, carry, and share the gospel every day. If you've ever failed to share your faith because you just didn't know what words to use, then carry the word with you. I include these pocket testaments in our visitor folders at church, or I give them out on home visitations, or I leave them in public places such as mm, gas stations, malls, stores, rest areas. Hello, this is Mike Brickley, president of the Pocket Testament League. Reading the Bible every day is so easy when you always have it with you. You won't even need a backpack. You can carry one right in your pocket. What are you waiting for? I witness the people with tracks, but also leave them with the Word of God for them to read for themselves. I'm going to let my people at Fellowship know about the Pocket Power Ministry. Thank you for your work in God's kingdom. What are you waiting for? Read, carry, and share the gospel every day. For more information, call 1-800-636-8785 or visit pocketpower.org. That's pocketpower.org. I'm in almost every school blessing class. I go to school with your children. We say the Pledge of Allegiance together. You see me around the neighborhood and you tell me that I'm a pretty good kid. Well, I'm one out of every five children in America and I'm struggling with hunger. This problem is closer than you think. My teacher tells me we can grow up to be whatever we want. I want to grow up to be someone who doesn't go to bed hungry. There's enough food in this country to feed everybody. Please visit feedingamerica.org today and find your local food bank for ways to help. Every dollar you donate helps provide eight meals for kids like me, quietly struggling with hunger. Together, we are Feeding America. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Restoring hope. Open my heart to sing. Taking the darkness inside. First day of July, I'm J. Michael McCoy. This is Restoring Hope Live. Is alcoholism a disease or is it simply a sin? Now, we know it is a sin, but is it, is it a disease? Is it something within you? This is the day we want to hear from you at 1-855-244-0077. That number, Chris, is on the Restoring Hope Live website, right? Okay, 1-855-244-0077. We want to hear from you. And if you want, 
And, and I have to admit, I've read it. It's a really good book, but I hate to say that in front of him. Uh, Dr. Mike Hartwig has written a book called Before the Good Night Kiss, and it's a great book on marriage, and we'll send you a copy of that for free. Let's go to Richard in Tennessee. Richard, welcome to RestoringHopeLive.com. What you say? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that, you know, there's a, there's a strong family culture uh, that, that passes on to generations, uh, especially, you know, concerning kids. Although we talk a lot about prescription drug abuse, there's also prescription dependence, especially when it relates to mental health, where I've seen, I've seen parents that from the, from the age of 12, 13, they were already taking prescription medications and this extended through their adult lives. And they start the same culture with their kids really believing that without medications, they can't do right or even see, see life properly. So what you're saying is, is that it, the parents kind of set the table for an addiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate it. Let's go live now to uh, Ellie. Uh, don't go, okay, we're going to keep talking. Um, Actually, let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, here, I think we can do this. Uh, hi, you're live on Restoring Hope. Who's this? Ellie, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, Ellie, how are you? I'm good. I'm well, good. I'm just so discouraged by what I'm hearing here. So you're uh, you're going to have to speak a little louder, please. I'm just saying, I can't believe I'm hearing what you're saying because I struggle with uh, alcohol, I uh, I know what it's like to drink and 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 try with all my heart to stop. I know the 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 power of God when He delivered me. Uh, he did that twice. Uh, the the second time I started drinking after not drinking for ten years, I swallowed that lie that hey I was healed. Um, I can take a drink, and I did again, and for eight years, there I was, back to trying not to drink, and it was with a, a gun in my hand, and I was just going to kill myself. I couldn't stop, and once again, God just doing for me what I could not do for myself. It, for me, I cannot take that drink. My body does do something that my husband can take a drink. His body doesn't do that. Um, it's so discouraging to hear you say it's a sin, not a disease. Oh my goodness! Okay, Ellie, don't don't hang up. Uh, so, it's guys, like okay, I'll go. I'll go have another drink. You're telling me uh, and that's okay. not necessarily what I'm saying. What I'm oh. saying is, is that. If we if we say it's a disease, we tend to back away and say, hey, you know, it's just I can't help it. You know, that kind of thing. No, I'm out no, of control. No, I've got to no, control that no, disease. No, no, I'm not saying that. But, I'm saying I cannot have a drink because something happens to me when I have a drink that doesn't happen to my husband who can have it. And, and I would, I, I don't, I don't that, just that's being that, an alcoholic. Yeah, that yeah, means there it's certainly a is a biophysical affinity oh, toward right. alcohol. So you'll oh, have a right. stronger drive towards that than the guy next to you a lot so of times. So why isn't that a disease called alcoholism? Why does it have to be? I mean, that's It doesn't just have to be. It certainly doesn't. I mean, to me, that's just something where, okay, we know that that is not something that I ought do. And it's so an you, allergy. It's an allergy, okay? Yeah, if how about that? Can, my little granddaughter <laughs> cannot eat peanuts. It's an allergy, okay? Uh, I cannot drink alcohol. It's an allergy. I, I like what she so says. is that a sin? No. If my, wife, a sin? if my wife plays in the park around a bunch of oak leaves on the ground in the fall, she gets, she has a reaction to oak leaves. So if if Ellie drinks alcohol and she gets a oh different reaction God. than somebody who can play in oak leaves all day, why isn't that an allergy? Why isn't that a disease? We're not saying that because you have an affinity towards alcohol that that is a sin. What we're saying is indulging in the activity to the point of drunkenness and not being in a position to carry out your God-given purpose is the sin. 
that's the issue. So if, it's, that, if you were to the point, Billy, where you would drink. say, I don't care, I'm going to drink anyway, and that's okay, which you're not, uh, you recognize that that's not a healthy behavior for you. So you do what you can to abstain. And that's no, really the, no, the big I issue. Do not, no, I do not take a drink because I know I have an allergy. It's going to take me, it's not about well, I'm just going to go get crazy, so I'm going to have a drink. No, no, I don't. That's not where I go mentally. Hey, uh, Ellie, I know the way I if, cannot have a drink. Uh, Ellie, are My you, husband has a drink. He's not like, oh, I'm going to have a drink so I, because I don't care. No, he has a drink. All right, Ellie, I'm going to put you on hold. If you'll get her contact information so we can send her a book, get a phone number too, because I'd like to talk to Ellie off air, because I. I can really relate to Ellie. I, I see where she's coming from. And the way I would define that is, is that the alcoholism isn't a disease. The sin is a disease. The sin is a disease. So is it an allergy? No. Why do no, some no. people react to it differently than others? Because they choose to? See, the no, same it's reason. biology, but I mean, an allergy is a specific thing. An allergy is an adverse reaction, whereas this isn't necessarily even adverse. It's just your brain finds that. Uh, to have a more likeness toward, and you'll have those cravings and urges. All right, in New Jersey, uh, Bill is a probation officer and drug related, drug and alcohol related counselor. Bill, you got stuff to say. Tell us what you got. You think it's uh, a disease? No, I don't think it's a disease. I think it can cause a disease. I, I, think, what happens, um, I think what happens is the disease is sin. I agree 100% with that. Uh, one of the best books that I've read on this matter, or the combination, is Banquet in the Grave, Addiction, Banquet in the Grave, uh, by Ed Welch. Um, and I really highly recommend it. But the thing is, what I find is the fact that these guys um, that are dealing with addiction, they have to get down to the root issue, which is the sin nature. And allow, allow us to understand that because of sin in our lives and in our society, it allows us to start behaving in such a way that causes us now to become addicted to certain things. Now, you can call it addiction, addiction, whatever you want. The bottom line to me is this. Once you get caught up in it, it can become a physical dependency by, by a TSM diagnostic material. So you can get it, a dependency or an abuse diagnosis, which allows it to become considered, quote, unquote, a disease. However, the thing is, that is the repercussions of the sin that the person decides, decides to do. There we go. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Nicely yep. said. Yeah, Bill, Bill, uh, that makes a lot of sense. I, I appreciate you calling in today. Hey, I'm going to uh, put, what, go ahead. Uh, go ahead man. I'm good. That's all I need to share. I appreciate your show. Hey, thanks for uh, listening. I'm going to put you on hold. And if you'd like a copy of Mike's book, which I have to admit is really good, um, <laughs> get a copy of it. It's a show about marriage called Before the Goodnight Kiss. Okay, Bob, you're a forensic scientist. You are hired by uh, trials, prosecution trials, or defense defense and prosecution, or mainly prosecution? Uh, it's about half and half. They okay. Request. Trials all over the country. You're the expert that comes in. You've spent your life studying alcohol and the effects of the body. Is it a disease? Well, I haven't considered it a disease. That That's where I'm coming from. You okay. have not? Have, not. Have, right, not. Yeah. I don't you don't think it's a disease? No, I don't think it's a disease. I think uh, it's it's something, and, and see, because the reason is, and I know a lot of people talk about it as being uh, hereditary. Right. Now, my father and his brothers, all of them have been alcoholics. And it didn't impact you at all? Not me, not my brother, not my sister. Well, not there's biblical allusions to that this is hereditary because, you know, the sins of the fathers pass on to generations and sure i mean so, yeah and it didn't in this and case. it didn't yeah and, yeah and it, <laughs> why it, because the lord intervened ah yeah right well <laughs> sometimes sometimes those little christians you know they the whole family comes but there's sins still passed down mm -hmm. but for some reason it skipped a generation with you i don't know that the sin passes down as it does the punishment I didn't think that people suffered the same th sin well, through generations. I, I, I thought the repercussions for a sin committed passed down through generations. Well, I think there's a case for that can be made for that, but I, I you know, I, I, I see that all the time. I see that the generational things pass down. Pornography is a good example. Yeah, but I don't think that we can put that into scriptural Pre terms. I think that's oh, walking yeah, I think a gray I area. I'd like to see that yeah, first. Yeah. I think Joe, Joe he, he's a pastor. Yeah, <laughs> he's I know. A pastor. I know. <laughs> 
All right, uh, lines are open for your phone calls, 1-855-244-0077. And Ellie, if you're still listening, I love you. I hear your suffering. I hear your, I really hear your pain. You and I are, you know, brother and sister from a different mother. Hang in there, okay? Uh, And I hope I get a chance to talk to you again. Is alcoholism a disease? That's the question. I want your answer. 855-244-0077. Next, live here on RestoringHopeLive.com. For you, it might be drugs. I'm J. Michael McCoy with Joe Mites from St. Gregory Retreat Center. Joe, you say St. Gregory Retreat Centers are different. What's so unique about your approach? Well, first of all, St. Gregory Center is more of an intensive training program than just an addiction recovery center. We help our clients set some very ambitious goals for their lives by focusing more on empowerment and leadership, physical health and healing, and a life of virtue. This goes far beyond mere sobriety, which frankly is why so many more of our clients achieve just that. Hmm. Can you give me some more examples of how, you know, St. Gregory does this? Absolutely. First of all, we believe you need to be well enough to recover. For this reason, every guest will spend at least a week with our medical team preparing physically for that recovery. This involves our proprietary IV neuro restoration therapy, as well as very specific nutritional regimens. So once someone begins to heal physically, then what? Well, now we begin the real work on teaching them how to reevaluate this process of events in their lives and to better understand why they think and feel the way that they do. Our program teaches how to change your thinking, how to modify your behavior to obtain better outcomes, and we really focus on teaching the life skills needed to truly find a life of purpose, joy, and fulfillment. Wow. Okay. That, that I've heard enough. I need to get a hold of somebody. Tell the listeners how they can get a hold of St. Gregory Retreat Center. You can reach out to us at 888-778-5833. We have counselors standing by at that number. Again, that's 888-778-5833. You can also do a Google search for St. Gregory Retreat Center and find us that way. Or you can go to your website at restoringhopelive.com and click on our logo. Here's Dan Celia with today's Stewardship Moment. I'm always amazed at how quickly we get off track when it comes to our giving. I guess I've been guilty of that myself from time to time. But Proverbs 4.23 says this, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Now, the way I understand that is the issues of life that the writer is talking about is pretty much everything that we do. See, if we get off track with our stewardship, with our giving or tithing, it's because of what springs out of our hearts. You've just heard a stewardship moment with Dan Celia of Financial Issues Ministry, helping you plan, give, and invest wisely. For more information, log on to financialissues.org. That's financialissues.org. Hi, this is John Vodder. A parent said to me, my child is on drugs. Is it all right to separate myself from negative people in my family? Well, my answer was very direct. Yes, that is all right. I'm a firm believer that both the addict in recovery and his or her parents must separate themselves from anyone who cannot be positive, who cannot be encouraging, who cannot be faith building. When drugs invaded our family, I made this decision. Uh, Some wanted to know every sort of detail, and this seems to be not their business. It seemed to be that they simply wanted to be a peeping Tom into our family. The Apostle Paul said we should focus on that which is honorable, pure, lovely, and commendable. So I say to parents, if you need to step away from certain friends. Find guidance through life storms. Visit lighthousenetwork.org. the hour 
We're going to go back to our phones very quickly. Nancy in Ohio is standing by. Our question today on Restoring Hope Live is alcoholism a disease? And I love what Ellie said. Okay, you don't like the word disease? Call it an allergy. Like you've got an allergy to peanuts. If your sister eats them, you're okay. If you eat them, something happens. If your husband can take one drink and is not motivated to take a second, and you take one and you find you're on your ninth, does that make it a disease? Yeah, an allergy? See, I don't, I don't, I'm does that not make it an sin. allergy either. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. just at sin. I'm alone in this room here. All right. <laughs> uh, is Nancy still on from Ohio? All right. Nancy, you are live on Restoring Hope in Ohio. How you doing, Nancy? What do you say? Is it a disease? <sighs> Well, that is a really good question. <laughs> I um, am quite involved in Al-Anon, and I believe um, that it's a huge, gigantic help um, to the families of those who are afflicted. Um, we talk about it in Al-Anon as a disease, um, and it does seem to very sadly go from one generation to another with all kinds of behaviors, um, not just the desire to drink. And um, yet I am at this point when it's interesting that you're talking about this, I have been um, writing down scriptures as I've been going through the uh, Bible, starting with Proverbs 6. And uh, I can start, I'm looking at the page where I've written all these scriptures about um, alcohol and wine in the Bible. Um, and, you know, I can start, <laughs> you know, giving them all to you. I think it would take more than your radio time, but um, it is uh, just such a blessing to have the 12 steps to work on in AA. Apparently, I've never done it, but also with the family. Um, so are you saying that it's a disease or it's a sin? She says it's a disease. I'm sa- I said at the beginning that it was a disease, yeah, but it it's, a also, disease. it's also a sin. All right, Nancy, you hold on. We want to get your information so we can send you a copy of Mike's book, Before the Good Night Kiss. Let's go to New Mexico. Jim in Nebraska, stand by. Let's go to New Mexico where Amanda is standing by. Amanda, is it a disease or not? Amanda, is it a disease? Hello. No, it is. Now, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, I don't think it's a disease at all. I think it's a sin. And uh, I can't quote the scripture exactly, but it's in Hebrews, uh, the uh, 11th chapter, where uh, Jesus talks about the sin that so easily beset us. We can't run our race because of the sin that so easily beset us. We all struggle with a sin. No two people sin will affect them the same way. It is the sin, but the, um, the the manifestation of it may be different, like the lady wants to call it an allergy to peanuts. The other caller before me, you know, spoke about um, uh, beer, wine, vodka. Yeah. You can call it whatever you want. Those are still called spirits. Still called sins. Yes, All right, Amanda, thank you very much. Let's go to... Probably a man from the greatest state in our 50-state union, the state with the greatest football team that ever took the field <laughs> Ohio? in all time. We're talking Texas. Oh, oh, Ohio? Jim That's great. in Nebraska. Oh, How are you doing, Jim? Oh, geez. Hello. Speak Hello. up. What do you think? Is it a disease? No, I think it's a sin. It's the original sin to wrestle the flesh, wrestle the eyes, wrestle the pride of life. Yeah. We've all inherited that same sin. Yes, same sir. Sin. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's alcohol, whether it's tobacco, whether it's pornography, whether it be anything, it is a sin. Preach, brother. It's a sin against Almighty God. Jim, what town do you live in in Nebraska? <laughs> I live in Virginia. I'm a trailer trucker by trade. Oh, I'm, I'm, I, I was born and raised in Beatrice, brother. Go Big Red. Okay. All right, thanks for being there. Let's now go to Tina in New Mexico. I love this girl. She says it's a disease. Tina, why do you say it's a disease? It's a disease. It was discovered. Okay, if it had been discovered today, I'd be like, yeah, they just trying to get away with something. But in 1939, a doctor who had treated 40,000 patients, um, Dr. Silkworth, said it's an allergy. There's something that happens inside my body that doesn't happen inside a normal drinker. A normal drinker is not going to crave alcohol after taking one drink. I do. 
And then there's some more men that did work found out that there's a chemical in my body that doesn't get processed properly. And therefore, because it doesn't, it tells me to drink some more. And do is it a sin for me today? It's a sin for me today because I know it's unhealthy. And the Bible teaches us that if we do things that's unhealthy, then that's a sin. So I don't drink today, and I haven't I haven't drank alcoholically for over twenty years. So for you, it's God a bless sin, you, Tina. So well, for I, you, drinking alcohol is a sin. I believe it's a sin for me because right. I, I think we won. That. Well, no. for this, for this <laughs> she said something very Tina important. finish because Tina, Tina's right. She's, <laughs> she's, she's got it right because her and I agree completely. No, we're, she said it's a disease. She said it's a sin for her to she drink. She said it's a disease, but her to drink is a sin. Okay. Yeah, now, one issue that, that I'd have here. I know unhealthy, and I know where it'll take me. Now, I struggled. I did struggle after that with drugs, but, hello? Yeah, 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 yeah good. I struggled after that with drugs, and I have seven, seven years, seven years clean from that. But today, I know that I would not approach somebody who was struggling with drinking and tell them it was a sin. Now, of course, I knew use another program along with that. And for me, without worship and without the program that I use, I wouldn't be sober. God bless you, Tina. Man, yeah, I thanks. love people like Tina. Okay. Now, a couple yeah. of interesting things Before here. We, first we of two all, minutes left, so go ahead. First of all, uh, mentioning that the doctor had found it to be an allergy. Well, that's not what we're talking about. And first of all, there is an allergy to alcohol. You can have a reaction from it where you break out in hives and get the rash and all of those things. Yep, that's an allergy. That doesn't mean you're an alcoholic in any way, shape, or form. There are plenty of people that have an allergy to alcohol that will break out and do all the things that allergies cause from having a drink. Now... So we can take the allergy thing off the table. Okay, it creates an allergy, but that's really not what we're talking about. If we're going down the rabbit hole of alcoholism, now we're talking about what is the nature of the thing that drives someone down this, this hole of urges to drink. That is a behavioral issue. It does it's have a, biological it, implications. And it's a learned behavior. It's a learned behavior. <sighs> what you say, brother? Disease? Or? Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we must get rid of every weight and the sin that clings so closely and run with endurance the race that is set before us. That is what? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Chat room, basically a disease or not? On the chat, the, the, one, the one person here is saying it's a disease. Okay. What can we agree on? It's a sin? Joe Mites and St. Gregory Center say that regardless of what you call it, there's certainly no reason we can't get you through it. Right. And I think that is the most important thing. Um, um, first of all, every one of our callers, I think every one of our callers admitted that they had a spiritual awakening. They didn't say that, but they had a spiritual awakening, right. if not a spiritual experience during, during when they or their spouse got sober. The second thing I heard was that a Christ-centered program and surrender to uh, our God who manifests himself as Jesus in the flesh and the Holy Spirit in today would tell you that he is a necessary element to remain sober and true. Amen. Thanks, Dr. Hartwig. Thanks, Joe Mites. Thanks, Bob uh, Mo uh, Montserrat. Montserrat, yeah, very good. Christmas. And Joe <laughs> Curley, Harry in the production room. We appreciate you guys there. We'll see you next week live here for RestoringHopeLive.com. And until then, do me a favor for your ministry. For the things you desire from your heavenly father, remember, to get them, just pray. <laughs>